Hello, today is October 8th, 2015. We're meeting today with, with Mike Martinez at his home in Fort Collins, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Mike, and thanks for sitting down today to, to tell your story. And I was glad to be here. Good, good. Well, let's start out if we could. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. I was, uh, I, I was born November 1st, 1925. I was, I'm a Colorado boy. I was born in Colorado, down there at, uh, around uh, Mancos and Natarita, down in there, way down there. In the, Natarita's way down there in the boondocks, as you know. Uh -huh. And uh, we lived out in the country, out on a farm. And most of our horses we did not uh, buy. We, there was a wild herd there, we got them there. And, and broke them? And broke them. Oh, boy. Uh, it was, uh, I don't know why I'm alive. <laughs> wow. Uh. And, and anyway, we lived there for a while, and grew up, and then the war come up. And, uh, well, let me, uh, before we get to your war, let's talk a little bit about you growing up. Uh, uh, any brothers and sisters? Yes, I, I, there was seven of us. Seven? And, and where did yes. you fit in that order? I was uh, the first one. Oh, you're the oldest, okay. Yeah. Okay. But I'm almost the last one. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll be 90 here in November, correct? Yes. Wow. So, uh, so you went up and uh, went through the schools there and, and worked on the, the ranch and... Yeah. Yeah. Never went to school much. I didn't mention school. I remember this is something you ain't going to believe. There I was, second grade maybe, and there was a guy coming there. He had to, he wouldn't learn to read. I, I, now I know where he was at. But then we thought it was kind of funny. He was 21 years old, going to school in second grade. <laughs> so I thought it was kind of strange at the time, but no, because schools were hard to come by. They were few and far between. Oh, wow. And you got to admire a guy that old to come into school. Yeah, right, right. And I imagine between school being hard, far and few between, and, and having to work, it, it was hard to, to. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. And I, and you know, by the, and back then, every family was very poor. Yeah. And that's another question I always like to ask your generation. Uh, how was your family affected by the Great Depression? Oh, kind of bad. But we always had some to eat, one thing about it. See, we lived down in the country. Uh -huh. Well, we didn't raise. We went out there, and I guess you could say poach. So we, we had plenty to eat. And all our vegetables we grew, so we didn't have to worry about that. Not like in the city. City people didn't have nothing. Yeah, yeah. They had to beg or steal. We we didn't have to steal because our parents made sure we had enough to eat. Yeah, right. Well, we had no place to steal from anyway. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it, it, it was kind of a crazy life that I've lived through. Yeah, yeah. It's been something else. Yeah. But well, what would you guys? I, I know there was a lot of hard work, but what would you do for entertainment for fun when you had time off? Just play one another and create our little fights, you know, as kids do, and, and that's the only way. And our yeah. parents had quite a time. And, uh, I was raised uh, out there in the country, you know how it was, and we had a neighbor that was a German family. So we got along great. They lived maybe two miles away from us, but you know kids, we were old enough, we'd sneak back and forth continuously. And my dad and that German family had a Navajo that they, uh, hired that they kept him working year round. He had a family. So anyway, they buried, uh, dad had an extra house and that's where he lived and that he worked for, for both of them. Well, guess what? When I grew up, I could talk four languages plainly. It, really? No oh, problem. Wow. I could talk Spanish, I could talk Navajo, I could talk English, and I could talk German. I'll be darned. Because our parents kept after all of us to talk English. They wanted us to talk. And my dad, especially, he, he really wanted me to learn English and become well educated. Well, I became educated, not well, maybe, but educated. He wanted me to become a veterinarian. Oh, really? Yeah. Yes. And I did not, uh, I don't know why I did not do that, but I became an electrician. I became an electronic uh, engineer <laughs> after the war. And anyway, from there, we. <laughs> Yeah, just, just farm there, and then uh, I kind of went up town one day and lied to the recruiter up there, the, the 
was ready to go to the service, they, you know how it was then. So they grabbed me and away I went. Well now, now being the oldest on a farm, couldn't you have gotten a, an agricultural deferment? And yes. But you didn't. I was gladly well talked to about it that after I messed up. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was kind of afraid to come home, but that's the way it was, you know. Uh -huh. Yes, I could have got a deferment and never had to go. Yeah. And he, even the, the guy that, uh, that, that, that was in charge there told me after that, he said, you didn't have to go. He said, you could have got a deferment. I said, I wanted to go. Oh, right. So yeah. I went. So, so yeah. I come to Denver to... Uh, to Denver to, to check in. From Denver, they shipped me to Camp Roberts, California. Now this is gonna be hard to believe. Now you were you, you, uh, joined the Army? Yes. And, and why did, out of all the service branches, how did you come to choose the Army? I guess because my dad was in it. Oh, oh was that? Oh, that, yeah, we need to talk about that because your dad was uh, in World War I. Yes. Yeah, talk, talk, before we move on with your story, can you, what, I don't know if he ever talked much about it, but can you tell a little bit about his story? Not just that uh, he was in the service, and he was in the service quite a while, and he was a disabled veteran, mm. you know, when he got out, so, you know, we didn't have too much to suffer about. So we, we had it kind of kind of made compared to the other families. And But I had a look of it, back on to that, had a great life, I guess, because we really wasn't hurting that bad, but we were hurt. Yeah, sure. You know, because yeah. there was no money around. Yeah, right. And especially me and... <laughs> The other three kids that was there, you know, learning all them languages is unbelievable. Yeah, wow. Well, now, uh, now that the fact that your dad had served in the army, when you came home and told him you had enlisted, was he upset about that at all, or because of his? Well, he was ready to hang me. Oh, was he? <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't very happy about that. No. So anyway, so I got to Denver. Denver, they shipped me to Camp Roberts, California. You'll never know who I, was next to me over there taking his training. Did you ever hear of Freddy the Freeloader? Uh, uh, explain who that Red is. Red Skelton. Well, oh, really? Yeah. You know, him and I took our training down there. He was the next building to me, but we were both there. Oh, be darned. <laughs> and that was quite, quite a thing. He was quite the guy. And he wrote to us after we separated. But I don't think none of us ever answered his letters. Oh, uh, we we just trash canned them, you know. Yeah. Especially when I went into Mississippi, Mississippi was oh man, talk about a rough life. Well, uh, let, that's another uh, something that really interests me too. I mean, here you are, growing up on this this kind of isolated ranch in in southern Colorado. Really, I imagine up to this point, really hadn't traveled too far away from home. Now you mentioned going to Denver, California, Mississippi. That must have been exciting, or were you homesick, or what would it? In a way, it was exciting. Yes, I did get homesick. No question about it. Just like if you left home all at once, you know, yeah. to see the world. And, yeah. you, and I, per se, I did. Yeah, yeah. And it, it was something else. And anyway, in Mississippi, I, I wish I'd never been, went to Mississippi then, and talk about prejudicial over there. Not against the GIs, it's, it's me. I had no problem. Yeah. But the other, the guys was man, it was really rough. Really, you'd see some old woman get on a bus, and she'd get out, and the bus the driver would hurry, catch her coat with a door, and drag her down the street. It was ridiculous. Ah, uh, wow. You had to feel sorry for the poor blacks. You yeah. Know? Very sorry, but that's the way it was. And, and if some one of them guys got close to one of the fountains for the white people, you wouldn't see him again. He made a tour to the swamp. Oh, it was wow. open season on blacks. Wow. How, how there was any left, I do not know. Wow. You know, wow. something unbelievable. Wow. Anyway, when I was in Mississippi, <laughs> I don't know why, but they decided I'd make a good guard. So they sent me down there to the federal prison for about a month to be guard. Hmm. And then I come back out of there, and then the company was ready to leave. Then we left, left to New York. New York, we caught the Queen Mary, and away we went. Well, uh, I'm going to back up again as well. I forgot the question I forgot to ask you too is, how was that transition for you? Not only leaving home and going away, but going from civilian life into military life. Was that much of a like boot, uh, uh, basic training? And how was that all for you? How did that? Well, it was kind of rough, but then you know you did miss home quite yeah. a bit. Yeah. But I don't know. I maybe you know how kids younger generation is just uh, I managed to live through without much 
trouble at all. But do, I, do you think as a, as a country boy that was a little, uh, a little bit stronger, you had an edge over like the city boys? I mean, through like... In, in a ways, yes. Yeah. Because see, we, we was more or less raised to defend your... To, to, not what's the word? To provide for yourself anyway. You was on your own, pretty much. And therefore, I had the advantage over you. Okay. Especially during the war. Yeah, okay. All so, right. Then, then we, we hit the... <laughs> after I was prison there, the federal, or guard there, the federal prison there in the Mississippi, uh, I went back to the company because, and uh, the way we left, we left New York, New York. When you got to New York, did you have a chance to get into New York at all? Uh, Very little, yes, okay. we did. We spent a couple of days. And once again, there. here's this small country boy in the big city that and must we have... We were plumb lost, <laughs> 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 to tell you the truth. So away we went. And, and uh, wasn't there... Um, I'm trying to think of the boxer that was from around your area, the uh, famous boxer that, oh, what was his name? And he opened a, opened a, a restaurant in New York. I wonder if you had a chance to go to that. Uh, no, I didn't have uh, a chance to go okay. to that. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. I can't think yeah, of his I'm name. drawing a blank too, but yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, so, so anyway, uh, we, we went to, uh, uh, got on the Queen Mary and left. And you know how it was, it was a convoy, big convoy. And we were packed in the Queen Mary like sardines. I and it and, and begs the question, here's a, a landlocked boy from Colorado going to sea. Did you get your sea legs, or how was that trip across for you? Uh, beautiful. You didn't in get seasick. I didn't bother me at all. Is that see, right? Huh? Uh, if I wanted a nice place to sit, all they had, after a time or two, they'd see me coming, they'd say, make way for that guy. Here he comes. They didn't exactly put it that way, but they <laughs> make way for him. Let him search where he wants. Because, see, I, I said the first time I went in there, I sat in there and I enjoyed the boat rocking and really thought it was great. And they didn't like, they got seasick and away they left. So after that, after a couple of days, you know, they found out that I'd say that and the way they thin out. <laughs> they didn't make room for me. <laughs> they didn't even ask me where I wanted to sit. It was kind of strange, you know. <laughs> no, it was something else. Well, talk about the, the conditions of the ship. You said they were... You were packed in there like sardines? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you didn't have a place to sleep. Uh, when we got in there, I brought a table for a bed uh, because they assigned you places where yeah. you could sleep, you know. And uh, some guy brought a hammock and, and he was crying. He didn't like the hammock. And I told him I'd trade him, and that was the best trade I ever made in my life. Because here we were in the middle of the night. He, the, the ship was rocking pretty good. He landed on the floor. <laughs> the next day, he wanted to trade back, and I told him, no way, I'll trade you back. <laughs> I, said, I said, I didn't know it, but I got the best deal. <laughs> so, so there we were, you know, there I was on, on that hammock and enjoying my night's sleep. Oh, boy. And he was fighting that table. That was something else. Then, then as we went along, uh, and there were subs chasing us. You know? Oh, really? Yeah, because uh, in the mornings we'd get up and you'd see a ship way out there in the distance, uh, smoking yet, so he'd get blasted. And as we went along there, and actually we had uh, two uh, sea burials off of the Queen Mary as we was going. Really? As I remember, yes. Wow. Uh. And we got, uh, at night we'd get the, the, the command to get ready to bail a ship a couple of times. We got up as far as the edge of the ship ready to bail out, but we, Happy that we didn't make it. Wow! Wow! <laughs> we was able to stay on the ship. It, it took us uh, twice as long to make it the right we was the route we was going than it would have we'd have sailed just right on through. We did not sail right on through because <clears throat> we we wanted to confuse the Germans. We'd go one direction, then another, and then you know, and that's really what made it rough, I guess. Yeah. Because uh. the Germans was after us all they could. Like I tell you, in the morning you see a ship smoking out there in the distance one of our, off of the convoy, that it was unbelievable. Well, that couldn't have made, uh, made it easy to go to bed at night. I mean, you're down in the bottom of the ship and wondering, boy, am I going to get torpedoed tonight? I know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you definitely did not know. Uh, anyway, we managed to survive that and got to England. We got to England there and we stayed there for a while. And guess what? We got to England again. Uh, uh, our company dropped MP duty. So naturally, we had it made, you know. <laughs> Here comes the other companies. They were always in trouble, but our company never got in trouble. <laughs> it was something, we had a great time. 
that way, you know. Mm -hmm. Just, but uh, it's because we pushed it, we pushed it our route. So that that was pretty good that way, and that, that was uh, I think that's the most exciting things we had in in, in uh, England. Did, did you get a chance to uh, any uh, furloughs to go, like going to London or anything like that? Yeah, we made a trip to London, you know, see how London and a few of the other towns, you know. You know, it was entirely different um, yeah. than, than any place else. Oh, sure. I, I was in a strange world over there. I'll bet you were. Right. And so, therefore, and then we got ready. And I don't remember the name of that place where you shipped out of it there. It was, and, and so we, we went, and finally we went and got, got the boat to go across the, across the channel. So D-Day had already happened by this, yeah, at this time? Yeah, D-Day okay. already happened. Okay. And this was uh, already in, uh, let's see. This must, have been, this must have been November when we got there. Okay, November 44, okay. Yeah. Okay. And uh, then we went across the sea there and we landed in Cherbourg there right after where they had the invasion. Man, I can't believe how them guys survived. Is that right? Talk about a little bit what you saw when you when you got through the damage and. Well, you you seen the bunkers that they had, you know, and how in order to get the Germans out of the bunkers, they just about had to starve them because if they couldn't get out of it, kill them, and they couldn't get any supplies in. So that that's it was about the only way because they had cement bunkers and everything else. They were very well protected. How we mm. wanted, I do not know, mm. and uh, believe me. Anyway, I, I, at the end of this, I'll tell you about this guy that I know. Anyway, we had quite quite a deal. Well, we landed there in France. As we was landing, we run another ship that had been sunk. <laughs> we thought we was not going to make it across the channel <laughs> when we was almost to the bank. We see the bank, so we had a pretty good wreck there. And then we went, got everything straightened out, and we bailed out. When we got to land, we got out there and had a. We were happy we was back on land, so therefore there we sat that night. Next morning, you'd never know who was the first guy I met. General George Patton. Oh wow! <laughs> I was sitting with mud clear up to my ankles, and he comes up to me and he said, "Soldier, he said you know you got to shine in shoes and shave." And I don't think I was old enough to shave then. I don't remember, but anyway, I had to shine my shoes. I thought that was a the craziest thing you could have ever said. <laughs> Mud clear up to my ankles, and I had to have my shoes. And that's, wow. the, that's the only time I met George Patton. He said, "You're going with me." So that that was uh, I don't know. That was close to the first of December. Because by the tenth, we'd already joined the. Uh, we we got assigned to. We got attached to the eighty second Airborne. Okay. Now what ta what division were what company were you in? Can you tell me what? Uh what division and? Uh, 746 Field Artillery. I was in artillery. Okay. Yeah. And you got attached, I'm sorry, you got attached to? 82nd Airborne. 82nd Airborne, okay. Yes. Anyway, that was just before the bulge. But anyway, we went there and we had quite a battle there. And finally, we hit the big battle. Man, things, I'll tell you, Christmas of 44, I cried for mom. Ah, uh, wow. And cold? Yeah, they were saying that it was like the, one of the coldest winters in Europeans, Europe's yeah. history. Yeah. Yeah. And, and were you properly dressed for it? No. All we had was, you'd seen, you'd seen them overcoats that they had then, which it was all right. It's not as bad as they had, I guess. But overshoes had not been invented, so you had to go with your leather shoes. You only got, and your feet were wet. And in order to keep your feet from uh, freezing, being that I was a country boy, I knew what to do, you know. I'd wrap up things with your feet, and I got the other guys to do that. And I think that's the only thing that <clears throat> uh, most of us survived is as, as a country boy, I knew that the bigger the group, the more heat there was. So we'd throw a bunch of them uh, 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 tents together, and you know, I, you know, I got to wherever I could to bunk together in there, but our body heats would help keep the place warm because you could not build a fire because you know the Germans would give them anything to see you build a fire. Oh, right, yeah. Because that would have been the end of it. Yeah. It was something else, man. It was colder than you can imagine. And uh, one, one day we, we lost a lot of ground there. <laughs> we ran into some, 
some of the real front guys coming back. We were going up there to help them, and they were coming back the other way. And I said, where are you guys going? Said, You're going to find out in a minute. You better follow us now. Really? Oh, jeez. Not after a while now. Oh, man, and away we went. So we went away, and finally we stopped. And we was there for a while. About that time, a uh, uh, battle of, uh, of uh, Bastogne hit, and the 101st drew that. And man, what a rough winter we had. And the Germans come up in American uniform, mind you, and they had American dog tags. They were spies, and they were ready, and believe me, them Germans could talk English as well as you could or better. And talk about history, they were up more on history than you and I are, hmm. even today. Boy, they were very sharp and very hard to detect. So uh, they'd come in there and mingle with us, and there wasn't too much you could do. Uh, but one time we did shoot a bunch of them. You know, they'd come in groups, you know. One time we, we did shoot some. We was pretty sure that's what they were because somebody had seen them someplace else before. He said, no, he said, they, they, they cannot be Americans. He said, they was over there uh, doing this and that. And he said, wow. it just doesn't, so that's as far as they got, poor guys. Hmm. I'm sorry for them, but that's the way it is. Yeah, know? that's war. Yeah, that was war. So we went there and we went, and, and then that's about the time the bulge was full of life and the bulge was doing well, I guess. Because we sure weren't. We were about to freeze all winter long, man. And that was just, uh, it was pretty near spring before we was able to move out of there. Oh, boy. Because it was, I don't need to tell you. And you'd see a bunch of bodies out there. The first thing you had to do was go out there and look for guns. You didn't want to leave guns for civilians to come back and shoot you. So we'd go over there and raid the whole bunch of groups over there down, you know, and pick up all the guns you could. And you picked up another souvenir, you know, like their medals that they had yeah, or something yeah, yeah. like that. <laughs> but the guns was what we were after. But we never could sleep in a building. Well, that uh, as you look back on that time, Mike, uh, let's let's think about it. You're out out in the elements in one of the coldest winters. You're, you're living outside. You know, you probably weren't eating properly. You weren't sleeping properly. Hygiene was terrible. I mean, any one of those things would would knock a man down. But you had all of them plus the the stress of war on top of it. As you look back on that, how do you think you made it through that? I, I blame it on to my training when I was a little kid. That my dad had trained me to survive the best I could with what I had. And that's what I blame it on. And uh, you, you get into, we got into a little group, sort of. We didn't want to, because you turn around and one of your buddies was dead. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> oh it, it was it, unbelievable, you know. To, so you got to where you didn't make any buddies. Yes, you talked to them, you know, and you bundled together to survive. But you didn't try to make good friends with them because, hey, next thing you know, you'd be laying there dead. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Torn all the pieces. It, no, it was something else. And one day we was out there running, as we was doing our thing during the war and running to this old boy. He was a kind of a heavy set kid. And he was kneeling, he was down on his knees crying. He had both hands on his belly. His guts had been split open. So I laid him down, gave him first aid, and he survived. He wanted to know my address, where I was from, and, I, and he was a Colorado boy also. Uh -huh. And he said, I'm gonna look you up after the war, if you survive. Well, I did survive, and he did look me up. So, but if you need an operation, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> just, just because I got him together, I laid him down and, and first aid him, you know, and called the medics for him and told him not to move. And I guess he didn't move. I marked him, you know, as a wounded uh, body. And they come up and took care of him. It, it was something else. You know, oh, and then boy. we went and then we hit the, uh, what was it, the Ryan. We hit the Ryan River next. And that, that was also, man. As we was going down, I remember there, when we was moving, there were Germans on one side of the river and Americans on the other side. But that's a wide river. You couldn't shoot across it because if you did, you couldn't hit anything. Because yeah. it was better than half a mile, I think. And we were swimming on this side, the Germans were on their end. Is that right? <laughs> uh, 
Well, you had to clean up. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And then this kid from New York comes out and he jumps right in the middle of the water and where to fish him out. He said, what did you do that for? He said, well, I thought it was easy to swim. He said, I've never been in the water before. <laughs> oh, man. That poor guy. Uh, <laughs> fish him out of there. And then, well, I, I know a little bit of your story, and I, I'm not sure where it fits in, but tell the story about the, the time when, when that, that dud landed near you. Oh, yeah. That close yeah, call you had. Yeah, that, that, that was during the bulge thing. Man, I mean, tell you, that dud fell right next to him, and the captain was not too far away. And uh, my food, see, it was lunchtime. My food went one way, I went the other one. So I got up, looked, <laughs> looked at my uh, dishes, and they didn't have nothing in them. So I went back to the cook. The cook said, no way. <laughs> he said, we got ration food you don't need. But one, you get one serving. You got yours. Well, the captain knew what went on, and he come up, and, and he told the cook, he said, you serve him now. That's how come I got my meal. <laughs> wow. Wow. It wow. was something else. Man. Wow. Yeah, that was, that, that, we had some crazy experiences like that, and then we got across, and we got up there to the Ryan, we had quite a trouble getting across. Because some of the, some other groups had made it across, but then they had run out of supplies. They had to come back. See, because they, there was no the supplies were way behind schedule, because the planes couldn't drop it and they couldn't truck it in, and we had one heck of a time getting supplies. We were lucky to win that war. Fortunate. Hmm. How we won it, I do not know, because you didn't have no ammunition, you had no grub, and clothing. We only you had what you had on. And little, we had a little old tent. We we hung on to the tent pretty tight to our tents because that way you could sleep at night, halfway warm, you know. Because a lot of bodies make a lot of heat. Jeez, you'd be amazed how much heat a body would put out. And that's the only way we survived. No, it was something else. And naturally, you could not uh, look for a German out there to steal some of his. Uh, clothing off to keep warm because then your buddies would shoot you. <laughs> mm. So you had to wait for an American to find a dead American to steal his clothes. Mm. Well, not his clothes, but his blankets and right, stuff right, right. in order for us to survive. No, yeah. it was something else, man. It was unbelievable what, what we had to go through. Dur during this time through the bulge and on the way to, to the Rhine, was there any time you, you got pulled back for, for rest and relaxation or was it go, go, go? It was go, 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 oh, wow. till we got to Munich. Wow. And uh, anyway, we went through the, through, through, through the, uh, through the river, through the Rhine there. Then we got up to the Siegfried Lines, and that was another rough one. Man, we had another rough one there. Well, we, we didn't lose ground there, but we didn't gain much very fast either. And as we, uh, I forgot to tell you, when we were going to go across the river, we was going to go through by the town of Cologne. Cologne was off limits for us. We could not fight in Cologne. How come? Because the Germans had stored all the history there and declared it open to the U.S. And they didn't want to destroy their, their uh, history stuff that they had stored there. This is the reason we could not go in Cologne. So we had to go around. And in fact, uh, in one of the pictures about the Battle of the Balls, I believe it was, uh, my captain's in it. Me and my captain were going together. My captain was in it, but they cut me out. Oh, really? But he's in it, yeah. <laughs> and uh, where we went, we had we walked around there, you know, went down there to go across the river. We did get across the river, and then we got to the, the Siegfried Lines, and that was another rough one, man. But after that, the spring was in, and we had a name. Uh -huh. We got into, uh, uh, went pretty fast after that into, uh, uh, well, no, we stopped there at the pri uh, women's prison camp. I forgot the name of the prison camp. And we liberated that. There sit them women without any clothes. They were ready for the fire. And, and we couldn't stop to talk to them or anything because we were, you know, we were trying to get rid of the enemy and mm -hmm. we didn't want to let him get his foot on the ground. But we had a crew right behind us to come up and take care of him. But I guess we were, <laughs> how would you say, we were the stooges, we had to be in front. Yeah. Uh, it was something else, I uh, can tell you. 
And the reason I'm not dead is because uh, uh, Germans did not make a bullet with my name on it. Because I need to tell you, there's a lot of them that just went. That, that had to be hard. I can't imagine you know, traveling and being with these people and then looking over and, and, and they're dead. I mean, I just, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I'm sure growing up you didn't, you probably saw a lot of animals killed and what have you, but I don't think you saw a lot of death and, right. uh, and, and you were just a kid to begin yeah. with, you know. Yeah. I can't imagine, that had to be hard on you. Oh, it was. It was. Many days I wish I'd have never done that. Hmm. But it was too late to change. Yeah. yeah. No, we, we had quite, quite an experience there. And anyway, after we got to Munich, we had it made because, uh, well, after we, we went to that past the six week line, we had it made because the, we didn't have much war then. It was all our way. So then we split. 82nd went to Berlin and we went to Austria, in Brook, Austria. We spent our time there, and uh, that's where the peace was signed. And then I was on leave uh, when when uh, when peace was signed. So we decided we we had three days leave. So we just we forgot to come back in time. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of our three days, we spent a week out there. You know, they didn't say a thing about it. Where, where did you go on your leave? We went to uh, Berlin, to the, the Brussels. Oh, really? Belgium, oh, yeah. wow. Huh? We went to Brussels, Belgium. And then what? It was something else. Boy, it must have been quite a relief when you heard that the war was over uh, after all you'd been through. You oh, you bet. After we had the Secret Bridge Lines, it was quite a relief because, man, we start seeing all them dead bodies next to you because you'd, you'd wake up in the morning and you'd see nothing but bodies laying on the ground. Just about, you know, it was something else. And freezing to death, and and the best meal we had was off of one of them uh, sea ration cans, and that wasn't very good. Ugh. Huh. No, it, it was a rough road to hoe. Hmm. What well, what can you describe what you, the the scenery is you're going through the villages, and and did you have much interaction with the civilians at all, or the civilians? Yes, because they were all hungry. They wanted something that you hmm. that you had to eat. That it, even you could have got anything for a stick of gum, per se. Uh, chocolate candy was top of the line. <coughs> and we did get a little candy on the sea ration, so we saved them and gave them to the girls and the kids, you know. Mm -hmm. and it was, oh man, it was something else. And the people were starving. Mm. Not only the kids, the grown ups were starving. It was a rough road to hold. Mm. And people didn't have nothing to eat. And, and uh, I'm afraid they're going to try to do the same thing over here create a war here. People don't know what a war is till they get into that stage. Hmm. Because it's going to be rough. Oh boy. Yeah. yeah and then anyway, so you we got, got to Munich. We went to Innsbruck, got over there, and then we come back from Innsbruck after the war, we get ready to ship out. And we stopped there in Munich. We went to one, our main stop there before I left. And, uh, the, the, the circus had been there and they'd captured the animals out of the circus and there was bears and monkeys and stuff in there, you know. So there sat this big old bear out there and we used to go out there and play with him. He was ill. Huh. So here comes the second lieutenant right out of the service, man. And he, <laughs> you know how it goes. He said, where's the sergeant? I said, he's there in the shop. I didn't tell him the bear was in there. <laughs> so he comes up and opens the door up, stands a bear and here comes the lieutenant like you wouldn't believe. You, was, you haven't seen a body move that fast. <laughs> he was moving on. <laughs> I'll uh, never forget that one. Yeah. So there were some, some funny things that yeah. went on, but not a whole lot, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, no, that was kind of funny to me because I knew yeah, it, yeah. it wouldn't hurt him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but he didn't. Yeah, right. <laughs> he didn't even know there was a bear there. Oh, man, he was moving on. Uh, what he was saying, you wouldn't understand anyway. <laughs> No, that's funny. Well, now, uh, you know, the war in, in Europe was over, but it was still going on in, in, in the Pacific. Was yes. there any, any worries that you guys would be transferred over to the Pacific? Yes. yes. In fact, uh, one day uh, after the war there, we were still in the same company. Uh, we went, me and this other guy wanted to come home. We'd been through the war all together, you know. We wanted to come home because you'd get a 30-day leave and then you'd go to Japan. 
And so we went up there with the captain. We were about half drunk anyway. <laughs> we, we told him we wanted to enlist to go to, to, go to uh, Japan. <laughs> he threw us out of there. He said, you two drunks better get out of here now. And thanks to, thanks to the captain for doing that to us. Oh, now. wow, yeah. <laughs> because we, we wanted to come home bad. You know, we hadn't been home. We were really homesick. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm really glad he threw us out of there. Wow. And then here, uh, not long ago, well, it's been a while, I met this guy that was in, in one of the 82nd jumpers. He jumped in Africa, survived. Jumped at D-Day, he survived. Jumped at the Balls, he survived. Jumped at the Rhine, he survived. Jumped at the Sick Reed Lines, he survived. Well, he's still kicking. He lives in Colorado Springs. Is that right? Yes. Uh it's hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And how he survived, I do not know. You can't really believe it, but I was looking at him. So I know he's still there. Well, I mean, you've got... Uh, it's amazing you're still alive sitting here yeah. telling the story. I mean, you've got an amazing story, too, that you went through a lot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it was amazing what, what we went through. And that's, that's the only thing we could figure is that the Germans did not make a bullet with their name on it. Uh, wow. Everybody else has had their name on it way they went oh boy and it was something else well it, it's easy to look back on that and see that now but at the time you always had to probably wonder is the next bullet got my name on it Correct. You know? oh i can't Correct. imagine how you uh, i remember there at the balls one time and the planes the german planes come up and they just straighten the daylights out of us so there was a big old tree over there and i got behind that tree and then bullets was hitting all around if it wouldn't have been for the tree i'd have never made it it was something else it was, it was pretty rough and it wasn't no game there was no second chance yes yeah, right right and I, I remember you talking too about uh, you know, the weather finally broke and, and we were able to bring supplies but they were yeah. landing in the yeah the Germans got the supplies and all we do is watch them go by oh. <laughs> And then that lead, you got to tell the story about years later when you, you ran into Stanley and oh, tell yeah. them that's always a funny story. Yeah, that, yeah, that was a funny story. Ran into Stanley and we were talking there one day. He told me he was in the Air Force, and, you know, and he, he went and made a trip or two over there to drop supplies. And that's when I told him, I said, if I run into one of them guys, I'd shoot that so and so. <laughs> he looked at me real funny. And he said, well, that was me on that airplane. <laughs> <laughs> I know Stanley, and we became good friends. Yeah, we've been good friends ever since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you you, you talked about a lot about being uh, homesick while you were over there, uh, and you guys were constantly on the go. Uh, the only option you had for communications back and forth were letters. Did, did right. were you able to get letters and, and yes. send home letters? And yes, we could write in any time. You never said where you were. Yeah, you couldn't. Yeah. Yeah, because they they censored. censored. Yeah, yeah. be censored. They were cut out. And every once in a while, you get a letter with a bunch of holes in it. Because <laughs> it was censored. What you got was censored. Uh -huh. What you sent out was censored. Uh -huh. So there you go. No, but, it was something else. But mail was able to keep up with you, the, even when you guys. Well, were... I was a little late. You know, yeah. it wasn't exactly on time. But yeah, we got regular mail more. You know, for the conditions, it was pretty regular. But no, it wasn't regular. Hmm. It, it was a rough. Rough road to hoe either way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the war is over now, and you guys are there with the occupation forces. What where did you go uh, once the war was over, and where were you? Where, take your story from there, I guess, after the war ended in Europe. Yeah, well, it ended there in Europe, and like I said, I was there, and I was uh, uh, over at the, uh, I was in Austria when the war ended, actually. But uh, then I come into uh, Munich uh, to stay there for a while to. They found a spot on some ship to ship us out, and finally they did, and we jumped out there. I forget what the name of that place was. It was out there at the Black Sea. Oh, really? Yeah. There. Yeah, that's where we shipped out of. And we come out, and we got one of the cheaper boats I think they had, <laughs> and it, but it was loaded, you know, headed for home. But we was have to get in that. But then after. Uh, week or so in it and I decided that it was the wrong ship because we hit a storm. Oh. I tell you, I swore it was going to go down. I've heard about those storms. Yeah, and that was something else. Oh. Man, that was something else. 
I don't know if I was scared, more scared there than I was during the war or what. I've heard that from others, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it was a rough road. Uh -huh. But then we come in and we got to New York. Outside of that storm, everything was great. We hit New York, we made that big old parade ride down a Boulevard Street. Oh, really? You're in the parade, yeah? Yeah, I was uh, in the parade. Uh, come into there, and then you come into Leavensworth, Kansas, and then from Kansas, they give me a ticket and said, we will see you some other time. You were discharged at Fort Leavenworth? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so, took the train home then? Went home? Took the train home. And, and, you and, couldn't fly it. Yeah, right. Really, you know. Yeah. If you did, it was very expensive or something. Yeah. I, I don't know. It was very hard to make connections on the and that's when uh, uh, I got to Kansas City <laughs> and couldn't catch a direct train into Denver or, or uh, Golden, uh, Colorado Springs. I forget which. Anyway, the, the, missed the train somehow. Uh, the trains didn't make connections, so I uh, dropped in the Atchison in Topeka and Santa Fe was coming in. They said, you can take that and you will pick up the train over there. It will a certain town, Satan. And so I said, well, that's not like the winners. They said, but you don't want to take that. I said, I don't? They said, no, because it's not the train for passengers, really. And they said, but it will haul passengers. And I said, well, that's the one I want. Well, I figured if I stay in Kansas City, I'll get drunk and probably never make it. <laughs> so I, I jumped on the hatches at the big in Santa Fe and away I went. But man, it was true, you know, that about that song. <clears throat> that conductor was stopping, even talking to chickens, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it was quite, a, quite an experience. That ride was experience alone, but I was happy I was coming home. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you remember uh, when you got home, what that was like? Do you remember that arriving oh, home? Yeah. And talk a little bit about that, the homecoming. And, and, oh, the uh, homecoming, you know, I had quite, quite, quite a grand time coming home. Uh, my friend, uh, my, my friends was there. And yes, I met them. And because see, uh, I, I guess I hadn't enough. See, because you, you, when when you left Europe, you had to have so many days of war. You had to have yeah, points. points. Uh -huh. Yeah. So uh -huh. I, I got out of points. A okay. Lot. I had a lot of points, and I was one of the first ones to come out. And except for the older, real older people, you didn't know any of the, the young ones unless they were very young. You know. Mm -hmm when you went and it wasn't old enough to go and, but they greeted us pretty well had no problem there I thought that was great but man it was something else to come home and see mama oh <laughs> man uh, I bet she was glad to see you oh you bet you imagine what I can't imagine what her, your mother must have she must be worried sick the whole time you were gone oh you bet yeah. she was you know oh. mm. just 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 like you and you, your kid, you yeah. know, your kids are gone. Yeah. Then, then you can see them and just, oh man, uh -huh. it'd be something else. No, it's, like I say, I just don't know how in the world I made it this far. Because mm -hmm. I have not lived a very easy life. Well, after I got out of service, uh, there was no jobs around. And uh, we were just, just sitting there, uh, leaning against the wall in one of the store buildings, and, an old friend of mine come up to me. He he'd been out, but he'd been in the navy, and he found him a job out of the mining. He said, you know, the petty right. And he said, uh, "What are you doing?" I said, "Nothing." I said, "There ain't a damn job to be found." He said, "Yes, there is." He said, "Come to petty right, and you can get on." So that's exactly what we did. So I went into mining right off, of, right mm. right out after that. And and mining was a very dangerous job. Yeah, yeah. Because I I guess. There was at least the guy killed a week or something like that, you know, maybe one, two a month. But man, somebody was always getting hurt or getting killed. It's really rough. So I, I tell you, I just don't know how I'm still here. Because hmm. I spent, I don't know, about a few years in there. Oh, really? That long? Wow. Yeah. See, right now I got dust in my lungs and also have a gamma burn on, on one. So, all, all related from the from the from the mines. Yes. Okay. Well, the, the the gamma burn is related from uranium mining. Oh, oh wow. See, because I worked at the mills, also at, at the uranium mill, and good thing I left when I did. Or probably 
that probably would have ended it, you know. And, and that's the way it is. And the uranium company told me I, I was in for a big uh, bonus for that, you know, the sickness pay. So I went in there and there ain't nothing there. Sure, the burn is there, but they don't, they try to tell me I didn't get it off the uranium. I don't know. They're out of their rocker. Hmm. That's all I can say. You know, just, and I spent a lot of time going to the doctor. Finally, I give up. I said, there ain't nothing there. All this, I'm having to pay too much money making trips for nothing because there's none locally. I had to go clear in the Grand Junction. Oh, wow. No, it was, it was really rough. But I still have my dust in my lungs and my uh, gamma burn on one of them, but I'm still here. Hmm. Does it cause you pain, discomfort? No. 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 Right now, no. In fact, yes, I've smoked all my life also, and I still do. And look at me. Yeah. You, I guess you could say I didn't smoke or something, because yeah. I still bounce around. I yeah. can do quite a bit without smoking, yes, but I can walk around fairly well, I think, for a young kid, you know. How, how was it for you, Mike, when you got back from the service, after everything you'd been through, been in the service, now you're going from all that back to civilian life. Was, it, was that much of an adjustment for you to get used quite to? Quite a bit. Quite yeah. A bit. Especially, you, you hated the, the towns you'd come, uh, you'd be in town, you know, and you'd hear some vehicle backfire. What'd you do? You go for cover, mm. and other people would laugh at you. Uh -huh. <coughs> no, you had to die for cover. I think you were telling well, that one time too about that crop duster coming down and oh yeah, you know, diving into a ditch. Yeah, yeah. you bet. Uh. I had to. Uh. I still can't stand that noise. All these years later. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I could stand still all right, but my feet won't. I have to go. Ah, wow. Can you believe that 70 years later? Yeah, yeah. Mm. No, it, it, it was some, something, it's something unbelievable. Mm. And then after, uh, so at, uh, you, you mined for a few years, and take your story from there, then after you got out of the mines. Then, then I, then I See, I went to construction for a while, and then I went to school. Are you able to take advantage of the GI Bill? No. You know? Huh? No. I went to school. I went to work for a, for a oil company, and they put me for school. Oh, okay. And actually, it was better because I got a lot of expense, a lot of money out of them that way. You know, for li living expense, I got my wages anyway, and they paid for the school, so I made it pretty good. That way, and that's how I got. That's where you became the electronic engineer? Yeah. Okay. That's how come I, if not, see, because uh, by then I was married, but that didn't matter much because, uh, you know, my family had to eat. And this work, getting it through, through the oil company, well, they paid my wages, so I had nothing to worry about. And they paid for the school, so I took advantage of that. I really took advantage of that. I was really glad I worked it that way. Yeah, yeah. Because there's no no hardship on that. Yeah, right. Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah, they were great. Oil companies are a great company to work for because they have a lot of benefits like that, even today. <laughs> and you said you uh, during that time you got married. Talk about how you met your wife and uh, how you wooed her and all that kind of stuff. Well, I met her before I went into this. Oh, you did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We kind of. We didn't grow up together, we just met, you know. And then she would write to me while I was in Missouri, and I'd write to her. And then we got married after I got home, you know, mm. after a while. But I was home, we decided to get married, and we got married, and lived a happy life. But till she passed away and left me. Oh boy, how, how many years were you guys married? 37. Oh boy. Mm. Yeah, 37 years. We Did she, did she ever say, uh, you know, she knew you before the war and knew you when you got back. Did she see a different mic when, when she got back? Did she ever talk about that at all? Or did your folks ever talk about 
they, they saw it. Uh, yeah, obviously, you changed after you'd been through. Yeah. Anybody would be changed, but no, uh, they, they, not that I recall. Okay. Like maybe there was, you know, and there had to be a change. Yes, because <clears throat> you know we did change. One night, I don't know what happened. I had a nightmare. Uh, me and my wife had an apartment. You know, the good thing was level floor apartment. So I had my nightmare, and out the goddamn window I went out. Oh, I said, not there in the alley. <laughs> And you wouldn't believe it. My wife come up and she was really talking to me. Because hmm. I guess when I woke up, I went like this and hit her, you know. And woke her up and she come up there and she wanted to know what the hell I was doing naked out in the valley. Uh. <laughs> but your life will follow you. Did you have quite a few of those nightmares? Do you still have them at all or has that kind of gone uh, away? Every once in a while, but I don't have any as mean as I used to. Yeah. So I kind of, somehow they calmed down a lot. Mm. So then you went on to be, uh, for your career then electronic engineer through yeah. the rest of your, work for the oil company or just? No, I didn't work for the oil company. I went to work for a broadcast station. Oh, okay. You know, the broadcast engineer. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. that must have been interesting. Yeah, it was kind of interesting. <clears throat> Then I come over here and I lost my hearing pretty much, you know, because uh, I'm a DAD on kind of my hearing, although you can't tell it. Because I, I, I can talk to anybody real well, but where there's noise or something, I, I cannot, music, I cannot hear. Hmm. Well, I can hear a few words, but a lot, a lot is drum. So I had to give up because I couldn't tune the radio. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. I had to keep it in tune. You couldn't tune it. So I had to give that up. Was that all uh, service related? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's service related. Right. DAV on that account. Okay, okay, good. Uh, yeah, that's the account that I got my disability. Not much, but it helps, you know. Hmm. So what'd you go on to do then after uh, uh, you're a broadcast engineer? Oh, a little lot of jobs because I was already had time enough to begin my, Re my retirement. Oh, okay, program. okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't do too much after that, and that's when I met Stanley. We went to work cleaning up a, a, a church one time. That's where I met him. Oh, okay. We had quite a time. Stanley <laughs> and I, we still have quite a time. Yeah, we became good friends, and we've stayed good friends ever since. Yeah, yeah. Really enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Through the years, did you ever uh, keep in touch with buddies that you served with? Was there any sort of reunions uh, at all or anything like no, that? No, there is a reunion, but it's too far away and too expensive. Uh, See, because just the trip, just the plane alone, was the last account I had was about $1,000. Uh, yeah. And then I had to go over there and, uh, no, no, where in the heck is it? I forget now, where the 82nd was the main, main place. Georgia, I think. Fort Benning. I yeah, think. Fort yeah. Benning, Georgia, yeah. yeah. There's a re reunion there every year. Or there was, I guess it still is. I got invited several times and I wouldn't go because it cost me yeah, a, right. a minimum four grand. Yeah. And I figured, no way. But, but you said, though, that that guy that uh, you took care of uh, and helped save came back and looked you up one day, yeah. right? Yeah. They did. We had quite a time after that. He was something else. Uh, uh, yeah, he, he lived about, oh, I don't know, minimum 50 miles away. Is that right? Yeah. Wow. He come up and looked me up, and sure enough, we had quite a time. Uh, he was thanking me for patching him up. Yeah, yeah, wow. Mm. He said he was sure he was not going to make it. Well, I wasn't too sure either. Yeah. You know, I passed in the best I could, and evidently it was a good job. Uh, Mud and all, you know, and, hey, everything was going on, you know, your, your shell was landing and everything, and here you are trying to sold it or fix this guy up. It was a wonder that I didn't kill him. Yeah, wow. Uh, but we've done a lot of first state things like that, you know. But he's the only one that really stuck in my mind, I guess, because he decided to come up and look me up. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, mm. No, it was.
to something else. Well, Mike, as we start to wind down this interview, let's talk a little bit uh, about uh, family. You got children, grandchildren, great grandchildren? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, got the, uh, well, we had one kid, because my old lady, the wine woman, couldn't have kids, you know. In fact, I just about lost her when she had the kid. Mm -hmm. And then we didn't adopt one, so all we had was the one kid. And now him and his wife's got two kids. So I got two grandchildren, a boy and a girl. And uh, they both live here in Fort Collins. And then I got a great granddaughter, and she's she's the boss. <laughs> <laughs> uh. okay. Yeah, the son's name is Larry. My grandson's name is Adrian. My granddaughter's name is Amanda, and her daughter is uh, Grace. Ah, uh, that's a nice, name. pretty yeah. name. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. And that's. The family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as we as we kind of close down this interview, Mike, is there anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to talk about, or any of the stories that kind of floated to the top as we've been sitting here talking? So that ideally we round. I know we probably get the tip of the iceberg of your story, but hopefully we rounded it off as best we can. Or do you think we pretty much covered everything? I think we pretty much covered all. We probably left a few things, yes, but you know how our memories are. Oh, seventy that. years later, I can't expect yeah. you to remember everything. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was something else. Hmm. Well, the, the last question I always like to ask you, uh, ask these people in these interviews is, as you look back on that time in the Army and everything that you went through, did it change your life, affect your life, play a role in your life, or was it just a, a chapter in your life that you went through? How, how would you answer that? I would say it was a challenge because you did have to change. You know, a lot of things had to change. It's a, that's a rough one. That's a good question. You know, and, yeah. and I don't think none of us has got the answer. Yeah, that. right, right. Sure, sure. But I, I greatly appreciate you doing this. Well, it's, pleasure's all mine. And I want to I wanna thank you for sitting down to tell your story today. But more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. We did our last session. You uh, told me a story that uh, I just thought was phenomenal and needed to get on the tape. So we've got the camera back up again. Please tell your story. Well, I grew up in the country out in the middle of nowhere, as uh, we were back then in the early 30s, you know. If you lived out in the country, if you lived out in the city, it was a different ballgame. And uh, everything we got, we had to work for. Nothing was free. And uh, our parents told us, do not take somebody else's stuff. If you do get something to eat, get wildlife. There's a lot of wildlife. So that's what we had to do. <clears throat> and Mr., we had to learn how to shoot. Cause we didn't get much uh, much ammunition. We had to bring back something to eat. And uh, as we was growing up, we had some cows, and uh, we'd have to round them up in the fall and head them to the shipping yards. Well, I didn't go. But some people think it's a long drive, but it was a pretty good drive. You take a hundred miles is a long drive. Wow! And that's what we had to do on horses. And you could not push the cows because if you do, you did, you lost weight. So you had to make, I, I don't remember, but I guess it's around 15 to 20 miles at the most. A day? A day, so they could eat, you know. And uh, so I, I, I think it took us about two, three weeks, I don't know, to go 100 miles. Wow. And uh, we had to sleep out in the open, of course, you know, and it was something else. And it was all horseback, and we went from, uh, from a disappointment into Dolores, Colorado. That's where the shipping yard was. There, were a close, there was a closer one in the other direction, but it was all private land. And the people could not afford to pay everybody. So they took the BLM land and went further, which made them a little more money, okay. which it did. So that's where I got in on that big old cattle ride. We shipped a thousand head of cattle that year. <clears throat> and as far as I know, that was the last one in the neighborhood, we'll put it that way. Yeah, right. wow. Next year, the trucks come in. Uh. How many of there were you in your group to, to drive that many cattle? I believe there was uh, five of us. Just the five to drive yes. a thousand head? Yes, <laughs> and if I remember right. Well, you had to work back then. There was no, no messing around. You know, you had to keep your eyes open. You had to keep busy. That's one reason you had to have more than one horse, because one horse would be plumb more out at the end of the day because you had to push him pretty hard. And that's a lot of cows to chase down. 
and there's one guy out there looking to see, you know, if there was any strays going away or something, you had to gather them up. And uh, as luck holds out, we did not lose the one. Huh. And down there in the big old canyons and uh, <laughs> places like that, it, it is unbelievable. It's hard for me to see that. that and that's the way we had to make our drive. But it, it was a one cattle drive that uh, I guess I'll remember to the day I die. And then, you know, as, and we, if you needed a horse, there was a bunch of wild horses there. We'd go catch us a horse and break him and ride him. Wow. And <laughs> right now, as I look at it, it was no fun. Back then, it was a picnic, you know, uh, because that, that was a way of life. Yeah, yeah. Same thing like eating. You didn't kill what you raised, you tried to sell it because there wasn't much money. I think top price for a cow back then was uh, $15 a cow. You can't even buy a steak for that today. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so that, that makes it quite, 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 quite something else. Well, I think what's amazing is, uh, you know, you, you were part of World War II history, but really your, your history extends there. I mean, you're really the tail end of the Old West, really. Yes. You know? Oh yeah, it was yeah. something else to think about that. And yes, everybody packed a gun back then because you know it it was a necessity. We'll put it that way. Although today they are trying to forbid them, and I don't think they should because that was the way of life. And, and in a way, today it is a way of life. Yeah. Because yes, there's lawmen, but they don't cover everything. They can't. Yeah. yeah. There's uh, too many people. The population has really exploded. Yeah. So therefore, I think the guns should still be legal. Wow. But then that's just my point. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and yeah. No, that, that was a wild thing to bring them cows that far and then put them on the train there and then ship them out. And they were shipped out to Kansas City, Kansas. That was a long ride. Uh -huh. No, I did not go to Kansas City, <laughs> Kansas. So you guys then turned around and rode back home then? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, had to, we had to ride the stupid horses back home. <laughs> it was, but we traveled a little faster that way. That, that 100 miles a long way to go on horseback. Yeah, boy, yeah. and sleeping on the ground at night. And, yes. Uh, uh, oh, boy. Yeah, uh, something else. I, I think it, you said the horses were plumb more out. I would think that you guys would be plumb more out after something. Oh, like yeah, that. that's why we trade horses every, every day. You know, they had some loose horses in the bunch there, and uh, you'd ride the horse one day and another one the next day, and them horses, and that, when it was cold in the mornings, they were kind of excitable to, <laughs> when you first got on them. They, they really didn't want anybody on them, so you had quite a time. It was, it was something else. And it, I would imagine the horses still today will get a little frisky early in the morning when it's cold. Hmm. Although they're, they're broke a little different, maybe not, you know. But that's the way it was. It was a rough life. Wow. And uh, I'm glad I. And that, that's one reason I, I did not understand how come I have survived this long. Yeah, right. Going through all that and whatever else we went through, and it was hard, hard, dangerous work. Yeah, it yeah. was very dangerous, yeah. yes, yeah. because a horse would throw you, he could kill you, and you know, fall with you and kill you. And there's a lot of ways that he could get you. Yeah, because there are a lot of people that did get killed. Mm. But you know, I'm one of the lucky guys. Yeah. I'm going to put it that way. Yeah. Not that I was that good. I don't guess. <laughs> I won't say I was, but I was lucky. And no, I did not ride in a rodeo. I tried it one time. I tried to ride a Burma, Burma bull, and, for, and believe me, that Burma bull and I did not agree, so he told me when to get off. <laughs> and that was my last try at the rodeo. So, uh -huh. you know, it was something else. It, it's very unbelievable. And then as we went and we farmed, and, and you know, yes, we'd round up our cattle every fall, but. Uh, We'd leave them down there in the mountains, and the trucks would come up and pick them up, so we didn't have to worry about that. And except uh, get them down to the lower ground in the winter, and, uh, and take them back up in the spring. In the winter time, we'd have to feed them, so we'd take wagons out there and scatter hay all over the country for them, and make sure there was all there. No, we didn't have to count them. We had a way that there were certain cows; they got certain markings. And for some reason, you picked on one, and if you've seen it there, most generally the, the bunch was all together. Why, I do not know. That, that I can't, cannot answer. But that's the way we kept track of the herds, you know. Mm. Certain marked cows, we spotted them, and 
That way you didn't have to count. And we were pretty close. Hmm. I'll be darned. How it come out so well, I do not know. Ha. But it was something else. And <clears throat> let's see. What else have I forgot? And then, uh, well, then, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, then, then I decided to go into the service, I think, about that time. And okay. that way I went. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you thought of the story and, and we recorded it because it's, uh, like I said, uh, you're, you're really one of the last connections to the Old West, really, if you think about it, you know. Uh, yeah. So uh, I'm glad we got this down and got it recorded. So thanks for telling the story, Mike. Thank you very much. Yeah.